This video is sponsored by Rainbow Black, a new novel by Maggie Thrash. These are all refractor telescopes with about five inches of aperture. And let me break that sentence down. A refractor means that the telescope focuses the light coming in using glass lenses. And aperture, you can think of that as how big is the telescope. Uh, what aperture technically means is the diameter of the primary lens here in the front of the telescope. And the reason that people are interested in telescopes with larger apertures is the bigger the telescope, the bigger the light bucket, allowing us to see smaller and fainter details in those deep sky objects out in the night sky. In simple terms, you can think of a telescope as an extension of your eye. So the bigger that you make your eye, the more that you can see in the dark. And with visual astronomy, that matters a whole lot. It's often people's top priority to get a big light bucket, a big aperture, which is why reflectors are very popular because it's much cheaper and easier to produce a big mirror than it is to produce a big glass lens. With photography, there are a lot of factors though that can even outweigh aperture when it comes to getting very high quality photos. You know, for one thing, the mount is incredibly important when doing photography, astrophotography. So while this review is going to focus on the optical tubes, the telescopes that you put on the mount, you definitely can't skimp on the tracking mount if you plan to use a telescope this big for astrophotography. And there are other accessories like an auto guiding system that make the mount even more accurate that I did use uh, when I was testing these telescopes for this review. So why am I reviewing these three five inch refractors? I've previously done these kinds of shootouts at two and a half inches, three inches, and four inches with refractors. And with each shootout, I'm trying to do multiple things at once. One thing that I'm always interested in is a kind of value to performance ratio. So I try to pick telescopes at very different price points. So value and price is one thing, but I'm always trying to learn something new. So to test common theories that you hear about buying telescopes. And in this video, I'm interested in two things. First, both the SV Boney and the Skywatcher are APOs, meaning that they are triplets that use extra low dispersion glass. And both actually list the type of ED glass they use. The SV Boney uses FPL 51, and the Skywatcher Esprit uses FPL 53, which is a higher quality. So I'm very interested in knowing, you know, with these glass types, what the difference is when it comes to false color fringing around bright stars, because that's usually what we're looking at in evaluating ED glass. Skywatcher says that it's virtually eliminated, while SV Boney says chromatic aberrations are significantly reduced. But, you know, it'll be interesting to see what those statements actually mean in a real head-to-head. -head. And if that wasn't enough, I'm also interested in a theory. The theory is that the achromatic refractor may be just as good as the more expensive apochromatic refractors if you use narrowband filters. So for the inexpensive telescope, I bought this one. This is the AR-127 from Explore Scientific. It is an achromat, meaning that it's a doublet with two glass elements um, and neither glass element is ED glass. This telescope is well regarded, I know, for solar imaging with a Daystar quark, uh, which you, uh, where you're only you know, focusing a tiny wavelength of light right in the uh, H alpha emission line. But I'm gonna be trying it with five nanometer Astrodon narrowband filters. So much wider band passes than a solar filter, but still pretty narrow compared to what we do with broadband. So we're gonna see if this theory holds up. I've tested each telescope with both a one-shot color camera and a mono camera with narrowband filters. Both these cameras are full frame with the demanding IMX455 sensor, thanks to ZWO, who has lent me these two cameras so I can do this kind of high resolution testing on my channel. Let's now jump into the physical characteristics of these telescopes, starting with the Explore Scientific. And starting at the front here, this telescope has a fixed dew shield. Uh, so you cannot retract this. It's all one piece, uh, which makes it a little bit longer to store. It is a glossy white. And then working our way down, it has a Vixen style dovetail. Only two holes in it uh, the where you can attach the rings uh, because 
the rings have to be at this distance apart to support the top handle. So it's all just sort of one big fixed uh, unit in a way. Uh, you, you could take uh, this Vixen dovetail off and put on a longer plate, but you would still need the uh, mounting holes to be in these two spots if you wanted to use the top handle, of course. But all of this uh, mounting gear seems uh, pretty well done. I will say that for some reason they put on this shiny metal plate, screwed on this shiny metal plate on one side of the Vixen dovetail, and I'm not sure what its purpose is uh, because on a lot of my mounts, all it did was prevented me from actually being able to slide the dovetail into the saddle because I feel like it made the Vixen dovetail a non-standard width. While if I took that off, it's the standard Vixen dovetail width. So I'm not sure why uh, they did that exactly. Maybe to, um, for some, systems where it's not a clamp style like this. It's a screw right on the plate. It's to prevent maybe marring of the plate. That's my guess for why they did that. Okay, and then working our way back here, they've screwed the finder shoe right onto the optical tube, which I don't know, I think it's pretty nice uh, because it puts this higher so I can actually use a guide scope here. But there's also a channel up here in the top handle if you wanted to attach a guide scope up there. But this is elevated enough and the fact that it's on the tube means you can use a guide scope successfully uh, right there as well. Okay, and then moving our way back here to the focuser. This is dual speed. Um, it's a two inch focuser. I think it's a Crayford style pretty cheap seeming, you know, not, not a substantial, um, but it does have the markings for distance. If you take off this compression ring, there's 48 millimeter threads back there, and uh, it does have both a tensioning and a uh, locking knob on the bottom. I'm not sure if it's possible to automate this focuser or if you would want to, um, but you probably could take the whole focuser off and replace it with a third party uh, focuser pretty easily. The Explorer Scientific with cap off but rings and dovetail installed weighs 13 pounds 14 ounces or 6.3 kilograms. Okay here's the SV Boney. It has a retractable dew shield and there are little um, screw holes here for retaining screws to keep this up, but um, they were missing in the review copy I was sent. This this review copy has been with many other reviewers, so I think they just got lost at some point, but there are three screw holes here for little retaining uh, screws on the dew shield. It is a matte uh, white with a little bit of shine to it. Okay, and next up we have the rings and uh, dovetail. It is a Vixen dovetail, pretty standard one with a few uh, holes, uh, different options for where to put the rings. The, both the rings and the dovetail have a lot of uh, cutouts. I think this is, you know, to keep the weight down and it is a very light scope um, for how long it is. The uh, rings have like a very thin tape-like thing uh, to protect the scope from metal on metal. And then this knob right here towards the back of the scope is for rotating the entire focuser. So the entire focuser rotates like that and then you can tighten it up like this. I typically prefer the manual rotator to be back here on the tube rather than up here rotating the entire focuser because sometimes this can uh, put things at awkward angles, but you could also make the argument that it allows you to uh, put the focusing knobs at any angle you want, which could be uh, beneficial. Okay, it has two spots for Cinta shoes. The copy I was given came with one uh, Cinta style finder shoe. If you had a guide scope with some height to it, it might be able to clear the rings. Um, I can tell you that the William Optics Uniguide uh, don't work with this placement of the finder shoe. So I ended up putting my guide scope on top of the rings here, which do have uh, tapped holes for attaching, you know, uh, 
guide scope directly or putting on a top plate and then putting your guide scope on the top plate. The focuser is a rack and pinion style. It's not the smoothest I've ever used. It's a little bit um, noisy. Uh, it does have a lock here on the bottom. It's two speeds and it does have markings for how far you have it racked out, which is nice for repeating focus. And the uh, field flattener, which is included in some bundles, screws on right onto the end of the tube here. So you take off the visual back and screw on the field flattener and it comes with this adapter to end in M48 threads. And then from there, you have 55 millimeter back focus to your camera sensor. The SV Boney with cap off, but rings, plate, and flattener installed weighs 14 pounds, 11 ounces, or 6.6 .6 kilograms. The SV Boney that I was sent didn't include uh, the case that they're now bundling it with, but I can see online that it's a soft-sided case and this is the bundle that I would recommend. I'd recommend getting the telescope with a case and with the field flattener if you want to use it for photography. If you're not planning to use it for photography for some other use then you could get the OTA only and save a couple hundred dollars. But bundle one includes both the field flattener and the case. Okay starting at the front here we can see it's uh, printed right on there. This is the Skywatcher Esprit 120ED Super Apo Triplet. The dew shield is retractable that far, and it's held on by two uh, screws here. And I will say that it does have a lot of play. Uh, you can see it's moving quite a bit back and forth. Um, but at least on this copy so far, if I put both of those down, lock both of the you know locking screws down, then there's no play. It's, uh, it only has that play when these are loose. So I'm not sure how big of a deal that would be or if it would po pose any issues over time. Okay, going down the telescope here, it has these really nice substantial uh, thick rings that are felt lined to protect the telescope finish and a uh, good uh, green, Skywatcher green Lasmandi plate here. So if you have other Skywatcher things like this EQ6R mount, it, it works really well with the, the whole color scheme. Okay, and now we're looking at the top of the rings. I just wanted to show you that there are uh, five tapped holes on the top of each ring for attaching a top plate or other accessories on top here. Okay, and then continuing down the scope, this is called a captain's wheel. And it's one of two methods of rotation with this telescope. If you loosen this up, it rotates the entire focuser. And it's not my favorite, uh, but it, it, it does tighten quite well. <laughs> I think I have it so tight right now, I can't even get it undone. Um, but I'm sure if I really tried or I got a better angle on it, I could. Um, and so because this rotates the entire focuser, it can put the focusing knobs at sort of odd angles, but you also have the option, if you want, of putting the focusing knobs on top, which, which some people do uh, like doing that uh, for whatever reason, you know, maybe having to do with adding an electronic focuser and how you want the bracket positioned and things like that. Okay, and then continuing down here, after the captain's wheel, we have the focuser. This is a 3.4 inch rack and pinion focuser, dual speed, of course. It does have a, you know, the rack and pinions on the bottom here that you're not seeing, but then it also has this additional steel rail here on the top, I guess, just to make sure there's no rotational play in the focuser. And this is actually fairly rare. I don't see this in too many telescopes. So I, I think it's a cool addition because I don't, you know, it, it prevents the focuser tube from um, having much play there. And then of course it has the uh, markings here so you can get repeatable focus. So for instance, if you found, okay, if I hit focus at around uh, five centimeters, then you can you can rack it out to that again uh, the next night and, and know that you're very close to being in focus. Okay, and then back here we have the second method of rotation. This is two rings that you, and again, it's about getting a good angle, there we go, um, that you loosen up and then that allows you to rotate the whole camera um, 
differently than how the focuser is rotated. And then when you're happy with that rotation, then you uh, lock it down with this top ring here. It's not my favorite. I'd, I think I'd rather have just a little, you know, uh, locking nut like is on many focusers, just because I think these glossy metal pieces are really hard to grasp, especially when it's cold. But maybe they do a better job of, of really locking down rotation. I'm not sure. My complaint, though, is just that it's hard to do, especially in the cold uh, with like, you know, you can't do it with gloves. You have to take your gloves off. And then if if it's if it's a winter night and I was testing these in February, so it was a winter night. Uh, it was it was pretty difficult to grasp those when, when those are cold pieces of metal. OK, and then behind that, I just have here attached the included 1X flattener. You take off the visual back and add this on. Uh, there's also a optional reducer available from Skywatcher and also one from Starzona, the, uh, the Apex reducer, which reduces even more. The Skywatcher one reduces, I think, uh, 0.77x, and the, the Apex from uh, Starzona is a 0.6. With cap off but rings, plate, and flattener installed, the Esprit 120 weighs 22 pounds, 9 ounces, or 10.2 kilograms. The Esprit 120 includes this really nice premium uh, roadie style hard sided case with wheels for rolling it. Um, and you can, you can have it in uh, this orientation or also put it up uh, vertically like that. Especially when you're rolling it, that's how you would do it. It has handles on three sides, a substantial handle there, and then two other handles on the short sides. And then on the inside, it comes custom cut uh, with all these cutouts for the different accessories that are included, including a right angle corrected finder, uh, diagonal for visual, and all the different adapters you'll need to use it with the field flattener and things like that. And then uh, this is a really cool thing with the Esprit cases. It has these racket balls uh, built in to protect the telescope. And before I jump into looking at all the images taken with these telescopes, let me tell you a bit about this video's sponsor, the novel Rainbow Black. When I want to de-stress, I love to get lost in a good novel. Just to get wrapped up in an engaging story is my favorite kind of entertainment. And if you're the same way, I have a great book here to recommend. Rainbow Black is by author Maggie Thrash, who is actually a good friend of the channel. And you've seen her in previous videos that I've made. She helped me make this one that went on to be my most popular video ever. And Maggie's new book is out this week. It's getting great reviews and it's quite the epic. It takes place over a period of 16 years in the life of a young woman whose parents are falsely accused of satanic ritual abuse. And a lot of the book is a legal drama. It's seen through the eyes of the protagonist, a child, as she grows up in and out of courtrooms. I think this is a fresh take on the legal thriller, and it feels a lot more real than a lot of thrillers I've read because the main character is so fleshed out and raw. It's my favorite book that Maggie has written, and also, I'm biased, but my favorite book I've read in years. So if that sounds intriguing to you, you can get Rainbow Black now. It's available on Kindle, in paperback, and as an audiobook. Okay, we're now gonna look at images that I took with each telescope. These imaging tests were done over two nights, one for one night for the one-shot color tests and one night for the mono narrowband tests. And you can read all of the tech details here. You could pause the video and just read through, through the you can pause the video and just read through these if you want, because I'm not going to read all of these out. Um, but just to sum it up, the one-shot color tests were done with the moon not visible, uh, behind the tree line at least, and I did three-minute subs with no calibration. Guiding was good. It was in an observatory. The object was high in the sky. So as many variables I'm trying to sort of, you know, take out of the picture as possible so we can really get a fairly fair test between the telescopes. And then the mono test, very similar, except I was using the 6200mm camera, 
uh, and narrowband filters from Astrodon, but the guiding was good again. And this time I did five minute subs per filter, uh, five each uh, for the HA and O3. So that's it. We're gonna now look at the images. And I'm gonna start here with single one-shot color subframes. And again, these are not calibrated. So here is the Explore Scientific AR-127. And as we would expect from an acromat, we have a lot of visible violet uh, fringing on all of the bright stars. Here's the SV Boney 122 with the reducer. So the reducer definitely has some uh, vignetting. The, you, you can see that there's a brighter part of the field here in center. And then here is the Skywatcher Esprit 120 and it looks pretty perfect. This tiny little bit of vignetting in the corners I, I suspect is from the 48 millimeter uh, threaded adapters I was using, not from the scope itself. Okay, and then now we can just quickly look at the center and corners for each scope. So the Explore Scientific, I was not using a field flattener uh, because it doesn't come with one and there's uh, there isn't one suggested on their website. So uh, you can see the corners are fairly elongated uh, and that's just from not using a field flattener. But here in the center, we can see it's a lot sharper, but we do have that violet uh, fringing that is common with an acromat. And then here is the SV Boney, and it looks a lot more uh, even and, and flattened out because I was using a flattener reducer. And then here is the Skywatcher. And you can see the Skywatcher, uh, we don't have the darkening of the corners and the stars look pretty much the same across the entire full frame field. Well, if we look closely at the stars on the SV Boney, When you look at the bright stars on the edge of the field, they get a little bit funky. You can see that that halo has some bites out of it. And then over here, you can see it's a little bit distorted with some split chromatic aberration. While if we look at the same on the Skywatcher Esprit, they just look perfect um, no matter where we look. Even in the extreme corners, uh, these look near perfect. Maybe a little bit of chromatic aberration in the extreme corners, but not much distortion to speak of. They look perfectly round, which suggests it's a nice flat field. Okay, and then now I have the stacks, uh, and stacks will, you know, just any problem optically will just show up even stronger. So the the violet fringing shows up even more in the stack than it did in the single frame. The vignetting from the reducer shows up even more. Of course, if I had calibrated these with flats, uh, that wouldn't show up like that. But I'm just wanting to show sort of without calibration what to expect. I was also trying to do these tests very quickly, so that's another reason I didn't uh, take flats. Okay, next let's look at the center of each stack. And this, I picked this center because it's, you know, where the tadpoles are. So we can sort of look at the level of detail in the tadpoles, but also of course, be looking again at the star performance. And you can see that uh, the Explore Scientific, the it's, it's not just the violet halos, the stars are also a lot softer than they are here with the SV Boney or the Skywatcher Esprit. For at first glance here, this is just with the screen stretch applied. The SV Boney and the Skywatcher Esprit look very, very similar. Uh, while the Explore Scientific, of course, uh, is sort of the odd man out here. Let's try to see if we can sort of amp up the differences here between the SV Boney and the Skywatcher. And the way to do that is sort of an extreme saturation test. So if we apply just a lot of saturation to each of those crops, um, that's what happens to the Explore Scientific. I'm just gonna close that because I'm not super interested in that one. But what I want us to look at here is the difference between the SV Boney and the Skywatcher Esprit. Because remember, this is one of the things I was interested in with different types of ED glass. This is the FPL 51 on the 
uh, SV Boney and the FPL 53 on the Skywatcher, can we see a difference in how well it controls chromatic aberration in the center of the field with this extreme saturation test? And yes, we definitely can. So I thought this was a really good test just to sort of prove a point here. Okay, I just, I've just zoomed in just a little bit more just so you can really see it in the video. Um, if we look at the stars on the Skywatcher here, there's a little bit of splitting, and some people have pointed out that that kind of split might actually be from the atmosphere. Even high up, you can still get some kind of atmospheric dispersion that can cause a split when you do these saturation tests. But what is really clear is if you look at all of these bright blue stars, over here in the SV Boney, we are getting uh, violet fringing on those. And on the Skywatcher, they're just looking perfect, even this with this super amount of saturation. And then if we look at this bright yellow star right down here in, in the uh, SV Boney, it, it is getting sort of a split color, while here it just is not. It's just looking, it's looking really nice. Same sort of deal up here with this bright blue star. Up here, we're going. We're getting violet uh, fringe on one side of the star, and this one, it's maybe a little bit green, but that just might be noise. And I, I think it's looking just a lot better. So, this I hopefully makes makes clear what are you really paying for with the FPL 53 versus the FPL 51. Um, it's it's a if you're really you know demanding on on color and with uh, bright sources like stars, it's going to make a difference. Now, if you look at the nebula, you can see the nebula looks basically identical in both shots. Okay, and then that was one thing that I wanted to test. The other thing that I wanted to test was how does an acromat like the Explore Scientific hold up with mono and narrowband filters? Because a lot of people say if you use it that way. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing how good it is. And I actually found this to be true. I was shocked at how good this was. Here is the HA uh, five subs stacked. And then let's compare that to the SV Boney and the Skywatcher Spree. Okay. And I, these are much closer than the one shot color uh, examples. And just for people interested, here's the O3 for each. The O3 on the Skywatcher is definitely the best of the batch, um, partly just because uh, the vignetting was definitely accentuated uh, without flats, while this has just such great field illumination that it, it turned out really well. But also, I'm just seeing much better contrast um, with the Skywatcher compared to the other two with the O3 filter, which is interesting because with the HA, they seem a lot closer, right? In terms of contrast. I mean, I'd still say this Skywatcher has the best contrast, but the SV Boney is pretty close. And then the Explore Scientific actually, you know, did pretty well considering that's an acromat. Okay, and then this bears out if you actually combine them and do bicolor imaging with the HA and O3. This is much closer. The, 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 we're, we're much closer together between the, the cheapest telescope and the most expensive telescope with narrow band than we were with one shot color, right? Or, or, or color imaging in general. It, it would be the same case if I did RGB and, and mono um, because that that violet haloing is, is something that is uncorrected in the blue spectrum. So even if you're to use a blue filter, uh, that, that extreme violet haloing on acromats is still gonna be there. While with narrow band, because you're just um, sampling that, that very thin, uh, five nanometers of light with O3 and HA, it makes far less of a difference that it has that extended blue response. You can see the stars are about as sharp and controlled in each of these. Now we are seeing a little bit difference in contrast, I think probably because the coatings on the Skywatcher are probably the best of the batch here. Um, and the coatings on the Explore Scientific are probably the worst. That's my guess for the differences we're seeing in contrast. 
um, especially with the, the more defined O3 on the Skywatcher. But another successful uh, test proven that with an Acromat and narrowband, it really punches above its weight. Um, but with broadband is where you're really going to have to want to pay for the more premium scope, especially if you like that look where you're, you're saturating your stars. And when I say that look where you're saturating your stars, I don't mean you're going to go to this extreme, but, um, this is just an example just to really show the difference. But even if you're just sort of saturating them above this, which is barely saturated at all, you're going to start seeing those aberrations on the SV Boney. Well, the marketing was correct on the Esprit 120. It, it, it's, it's virtually eliminated that chromatic aberration on the stars. Okay, so hopefully that was all uh, useful. I really enjoyed this test. I, I found that uh, by having these sort of goals of what I was trying to find out, it, it helped me sort of focus on analyzing the results and it was a lot of fun. I did take all of the data and combined it all together just to make a final picture. Uh, it's just for fun. Uh, so this is my final picture of the tadpoles and the surrounding area. And I like this picture. It's, it's I think it's under 10 hours of data, but it's it, it came out pretty well due to my dark skies. And I, I didn't use the broadband data from the Explorer Scientific because if I had combined this in, it would have been distracting. So I, I just used the broadband data from the SV Boney and the Skywatcher Esprit. And then I used the narrowband data from all three telescopes. And the processing on this one, I just did a starless on the narrowband and then blended that with the broadband to get the natural star color. You're now seeing everyone who supports this YouTube channel over on patreon.com slash nebula photos. It's an excellent community of amateur astrophotographers at all different experience levels, but everyone who is on my Patreon, I have found have been people that want to learn and people that are willing to share their own expertise. And there's a few ways we do that. One is there is an active discord, which is like a members only area uh, on, on my message board. And you can get involved there in a monthly imaging challenge, but there's also just all kinds of different discussions happening all the time over there. And another way that you can uh, get involved and give share your own expertise is I do a monthly Zoom call with the whole community. And then once in a while, uh, we do in-person events and specialized uh, Zoom calls as well. And I really can't thank my Patreon members enough because I'm now doing Nebula Photos full time, thanks to all of you. And it's what allows me to make these in-depth uh, reviews like the one you just saw, to have the time to actually uh, sort through all of this data and, and analyze it. it takes a lot of time. So if you enjoy this YouTube channel, I think you're going to get a lot of benefit out of joining my Patreon community. And it starts at just $1 a month. Uh, and for that, you get direct messaging support with me, that Zoom call that I mentioned, the Patreon side of the Discord, which includes the monthly imaging challenge, and a whole lot more. There's some exclusive videos over on Patreon. So if you're interested, head over to patreon.com slash nebulaphotos. Till next time, this has been Nico Carver, Clear Skies.